Thank you for joining us. My name is Greg Hazen, and I am part of the product support group of Teledyne ISCO. I've been with ISCO for approximately 21 years, working in the repair department for repairing your samplers and flow meters, and moving up to work in the product support group to help them answer your questions on a daily basis. Uh, thank you, Bob and Sharon, for the introduction. Um, today's webinar will cover multiple questions that were sent in in advance. Um, and we will also answer additional questions at the end by using the Q&A feature that Sharon mentioned. Our first topic of discussion today, uh, we're gonna cover several topics, maintenance, general service, uh, operational features, and applications. Our first uh, um, topic of discussion is the general maintenance and service is required for working on our portable samplers. The first question we had was, when should pump tubing be, be replaced? The samplers, the 6712 and other samplers of ours, have an actual pump um, revolution counter that determines how many rotations the pump has gone through during the sampling cycle since you replaced the last pump tube. The, most of these samplers have a 1 million pump count um, that's not the same as revolutions, but it's a, a counter that allows you to know when the pump tubing may be need to be replaced. A warning will appear on the front screen that will tell you, please replace pump tube. You can then replace the pump tube and reset the counter within the software, and it will continue to start counting for that next tube. Now, say you determine that the pump tube did not reach a level of wear, uh, you can set additional uh, a larger length of time between the alarms that are set uh, in the sampler for give you saying up to 9 million pump counts instead of 1 million. That's a good way for you to make sure you have a pump tube that gets replaced, but you get the most life out of it before you have a tube burst, which causes more mess, more, more problems within the unit as well. Second question we had was, um, how should the pump rotors be cleaned? Now, what I have found over the years of working with people in the field is that the pump tube, which is a silicone-based pump tube, will slough off some material over time as wear happens on the pump tube, and it kind of attaches itself to the rotors as they spin. Now, this can cause the pump tubing to be pinched more often if it's not cleaned off, or pinched uh, harder if it's not cleaned off. So in the process of changing pump tubes or in general maintenance, Checking to see that the rotors, which is what spin around and pinch the tube, have not gotten that buildup of the material. Uh, using a light detergent or a mild detergent, such as Simple Green or uh, maybe Dawn detergent, to wipe the rollers off or just kind of clean the material off, that will help you to get more pump tubing life out of your tubes. Don't use anything that could scratch the rotors um, because what we have found over time is if people have really worked at scratching the uh, material off, they can damage the rotor and put a, a sharp edge on it, which could then cause your pump tubing to have less of a life. So making sure that you clean them off in a, a way that's not going to cause damage, that will help you extend your, your pump tubing life and the use of your sampler. There is a on the desiccant, that's our next question here, there is a, a round disc on the front of our samplers that has a 20, 30, and a 40 on it. Now what those are, the 20, 30, 40, is the percent of relative humidity inside of the sampler case. So as you, if you buy the new sampler, it should be a nice bright blue, it would be a dry, less than 20% less than humidity. Now, as you're in the case or as the unit gets older, there's maybe a little bit of air exchange from the outside world, um, that humidity indicator will start turning uh, a little whiter color. So it'll start turning lighter blue and then to white. Now, as you start seeing that occur between the 20 and 30, uh, we recommend that you replace your uh, desiccant bags, which are inside the unit, with when you reach about the 30% when that starts getting white. Um, that way you maintain the dry atmosphere inside there that the electronics would like to have so no corrosion or damage occurs in your circuit boards. 
One other point is if you do manage to get water inside the unit from some reason due to a uh, flood or some sort of uh, a pump tubing bursting and water getting inside the unit or rain getting in the unit somehow, um, you'll that will turn almost a pink color if there's extreme amounts of humidity. So looking for that will be a good indicator if there is another problem. Our next section we're gonna cover is the operational features or general operation um, of the samplers. We had a question that was, how do liquid detectors work? So we're gonna go through quickly how the liquid detectors work and some of the errors you'll see with liquid detectors that you can test for out in the field. Um, the liquid detector operation theory works on a pressure sensor. So how it works is a spike in the voltage uh, based of, of a sensor that we see in when the water reaches that area of the liquid detector. The liquid detector in our samplers looks like a Band-Aid. Uh, it's got a, kind of a, a gold, and then the middle is like a little square white block. So it kind of looks just like a Band-Aid. And it usually is on the intake line of the pump coming in. So as the water comes up to it, it reaches the liquid detector before it reaches the rotors. Now the liquid detector works by uh, pressure, like I said. Now when the pump rotor is spinning and there's no water in the tube or near the liquid detector, water, or sorry, air pressurizes easier than water, so the pump tubing doesn't expand or contract very much when air is in the line next to the liquid detector. Now, as the water reaches the liquid detector, that water is there, and water does not pre compress very easy, so it wants to expand more in the tube. When the water reaches the liquid detector and that rotor is spinning, it expands the tubing out more, causing us to see a signal that says the liquid has reached the pump tube or reached the pump itself and is ready to be start counting how many rotations we do so we can deliver your correct volume. Some of the problems we see with that is uh, people will get errors that say no liquid detected or no more liquid detected. The liquid detector, like I said, works best when there is a, a full stream of water coming up through the tube. If air is being introduced into the line via a, maybe the, the uh, strainer is not completely submerged in the water down in the stream where you're gathering the sample, then we're pulling up slugs of air, or maybe there's a cut in the line or a loose fitting or something where we're getting air introduced in the line, those slugs of air reach that liquid detector. And again, that's air, so it compresses fairly easy, which then we don't see as a liquid. So that will cause those no liquid detected or no more liquid detected if we're not pulling up a nice stream of water. So making sure your, your strainer is completely submerged and there's no leaks in the lines will help you have that issue, uh, fix that issue. If you do have liquid detector issues and want to test this out, opening up the door above where the liquid detector is and running the pump and then rubbing with your finger on that liquid detector to apply a little bit of pressure when water reaches your, in the line, when it reaches your finger area while you're rubbing back and forth, that will allow you to test if the liquid detector is giving you issues or not. Um, calling in the customer, our, our tech service department, we would happily help you out as well to, to work through some of those problems. What options are available for flow-based uh, signaling. So flow pace sampling uh, requires some sort of signal to be sent to our samplers to therefore know when to take samples. Again, flow pace is based off of a certain amount of volume that is flowed through the channel that you're sampling for and you want to make your samples occur at regular intervals of flow versus time. So some of the options that are available for our flow pace sampling is the 4 to 20 milliamp interface. We see this used a lot with flow meters that uh, have a 4 to 20 output um, or some sort of SCADA or uh, PLC that is able to give us a 4 to 20 signal based off of flow some, from some other devices or some sort of mag meter or something in your system. We can use that 4 to 20 signal using our 4 to 20 milliamp interface, input interface, to pace our sampler based off the amount of flow. We just need to know the scaling factor to help you uh, figure out what volume that amount would be. Uh, the next one we typically see is flow pulses. 
Now, our, all of our samplers can do flow pulses, which means we're looking for some sort of signal coming into one of our, our, our pins on our sampler that is between five and 15 volts. So someplace between five and 15 volt signal of a pulse that may be a SCADA system, PLC or other flow meter is sending to us after X amount of gallons. So every thousand gallons, it sends us a 12 volt pulse. The sampler then counts down the pulses and takes your sample at the time when it reaches zero. The, the last one that we can use for our flow pace sampling is our flow modules in our 6712 or Avalanche samplers. This flow module, we make one that's called the 720, which is a submerged probe, the 730 module, which is a bubbler module, the 750, which is an area velocity sensor, and the 780 module, which is a four to 20 milliamp interface as well uh, to give us that signal. Now, those flow modules are able to pace a, the sampler by telling, by actually measuring a level and or a velocity in the stream and therefore calculating the flow through the stream and pacing it without the need of an additional flow meter or a PLC or something sending us that signal. The sampler itself takes on flow metering caper, capabilities uh, by actually measuring the flow and therefore pacing the sampler. Next, we'll move on to some application questions that we've received. First question we had is what application or what solution would you use in an application where you're dealing with low flow? Um, in a low flow situation, you're dealing with a nor our normal strainer is uh, one inch in height when it's laying down in the flow stream. So if you lay it down in, uh, say, like a channel in a manhole, the, the strainer itself is about an inch tall. So you need at least one inch of water flowing through that stream at all times to make sure you don't unsubmerge the strainer and therefore introduce those air slugs that we were talking about earlier in a sample program. Um, what we make are some low flow strainers. Um, our low flow strainer, our standard one, is about three quarters of an inch tall. So you could have it in a laying in the stream bed and able to take those samples uh, if even if the water dropped a little bit. We also make some ultra low flow or other strainers in our special products department that can sip off the bottom probably less than a half an inch or less where you're, they're very small strainers and the holes are oriented towards the bottom of the stream. So therefore you're pulling off the very bottom of the stream for those very low flow applications where you're trying to gather a sample. Sometimes the use of a stilling well or, or dam structure can be introduced into a flow, but again, you have to worry about backing up any sort of um, pipes or something by damming up water but that would give you the ability to raise the level of the water to help get your sample. But again, you're also introducing the ability for the, the silting to it occur because you're slowing down the flow by the use of a dam structure in the flow. So there's pluses and minuses to doing that. Uh, you just need to weigh your options on what you need to do in your situation. Next question was recommendations for portable sampling setups in a stormwater drain um, based off of it being right in a driveway for a parking lot, kind of specific question here. Uh, the, the, the question, uh, the best way to look at this one is where can you put the sampler? Does it have to be off to the side? Do you need to have a long-term? Does it, um, one of the options you could do is put a stormwater box or some sort of enclosure where you can put the sampler to protect it. Um, otherwise, if the manhole could support, uh, the samplers could be suspended in the manhole, if uh, that way you could close it back up again. So we do make what are called pro hangers, which allow you to suspend the sampler head uh, or the whole sampler and, and center section and base and bottle down in the manhole, and then pull that back up to the surface when you're ready to gather your samples. If you cannot, put it down in the manhole, the next thought uh, would be to create some sort of um, I, I, uh, some sort of way for the cars to drive over the tubes without damaging them. They make uh, cable guards out there. I, I know we don't make those, but those are, are a possibility where you'd purchase some 
uh, cable guards to allow the tubes for the strainer or for the suction line to go lay down in that along with any uh, lines for any flow metering sensors and then the cars could drive over that without crushing them. Uh, some people have suggested putting down some conduit. Uh, maybe I've had some other people that have done um, use like two by fours that cars are able to drive over but then they don't allow the devices or the, the cars to crush the tubes of the sampler that are, are across the roadway so depends on your situation where you're at the 720 module um, how to use that to trigger sampling the 720 module is a submerged probe which means it measures the depth of the water only. So it's a pressure sensor that measures the depth of the water. If you have a, uh, if you're wanting to pace the sampler, we would need some sort of primary device or Manning's equation to use to try to calculate a flow rate. But if you're just using it to trigger samples, so say when water reaches above a certain amount, that's also what could be done with the 720. So every time it would see more than say an inch of water, it would start enable the sample program to start gathering its sample from that storm event you're trying to get. So how you would do that, you just program the sampler to enable based off of a certain level. And the 720 and the 6712 could work together to do that for you. Okay, the next question we had was somebody uh, was having some issues with losing their strainers they were the low flow stainless steel like we discussed earlier because they're having maybe a little bit smaller volume there of flow um, how can we secure them one of my uh, suggestions in this case would be to if you could secure them using one of our mounting rings or a mounting plate down in the channel you could secure those either through straps or some sort of ties that would hold that to the plate, therefore reducing the possibility that something coming down the man, coming down the stream through the manhole could dislodge that or pull them off. Um, making sure that if they're coming loose off the end of the, the suction line, maybe getting some tubing clamps that you could just uh, tighten down and make sure they're nice and tight so that they don't pull off of your pump tube. So those are some of my options with that. Can samplers be installed in building cleanouts? Um, when taking wastewater samplers, how do you prevent materials from plugging up and blocking the sampler when they're taking samples? This is where strainers, uh, we'll talk about that first, strainers come into play. The strainers help prevent rags or other material from being pulled into the edge of the back of the end of the sample tube or the suction line and therefore blocking you from taking samples. Uh, the, the strainers have holes around all the sides of them, uh, which then allows, even though one side may be plugged, the other side is still able to take samples and pull up your volume for your samples. Um, as for if you're dealing with a lot of plugging, ragging or uh, blocking of the strainer, you may need to just be more diligent on maintenance and visiting the site to make sure it's cleared. Sometimes it's, it's the amount of materials coming down. We may not be able to, just without a lot of maintenance, may not be able to handle uh, without getting on, in on site and cleaning them off more often. Uh, installed in building cleanouts, yes. Uh, we have people that do that, say in residence halls, for especially for the COVID sampling, uh, just in, in the wastewater streams coming right out of there. Uh, you just got to make sure you get everything sealed up. You don't want any blockages or backups to get into the building through cleanouts if they're not sealed up properly. We hear a lot of people that um, need to sample from deep vertical sampling. Um, these are most. Uh, peristolic pumps are only able to sample between 26 and 28 feet vertically with a vertical rise. Um, the horizontal rise, uh, 99 feet is what we can deal with typically on the samplers, but the vertical rise of 28 feet, what you encounter there is the weight of the water in the tube is unable to be pulled up by the peristolic um, rotors spinning around and around. We only can create that much suction where it can only lift that much water vertically. 
How you can overcome that is through the use of a booster pump is the first option. A booster pump is a sampler, uh, sampler head that is controlled by your your sampler that is at the surface or wherever you're gathering the sample, but you lower that other sampler head closer to the surface of the water. So you get that sampler head down into the about less than 26 feet or as close as you can um, to the surface of the water. And then water is pumped up through that pump and then continues its way upwards to the other source or to your main sampler. Uh, we can push the water up a lot farther than we can pull it. So we just keep piling more water behind it. We kind of push it on the way up and then the sampler at the surface continues and gathers your sampler. Um, our booster pump that we sell through our special products department, uh, we send it with about an 80 foot uh, suction line and strainer and, uh, and, and the electrical connections. So you're able to, to pull from those vertical distances if you're absolutely necessary. People that don't want to go that route, uh, I see also do the secondary route, which is they put a sump pump or some other sort of pump that they down in the where they want to gather the sample and then continuously send water vertically through that sump to a flow through chamber uh, nearer the surface where our sampler is that we're able to gather the water for the sample at that source and then the water in that sump system continues back down into the, the original source. Um, so that is one of the other options I see is just, it, it's just more of the moving the water vertically so we can gather the sample at a less than 26 foot depth. Now in the last year, we all have seen a lot more samplers being used for water-based epidemiology, which is the WBE, and COVID sampling. So what are we seeing with that? Um, the samplers we're seeing used with that are typically used to gather a sample during a certain time frame and then deliver that to a lab to be tested for COVID to determine a, uh, the, the source's um, uh, amount of COVID volume that we're seeing come through the samples. Now, with the sampling, um, we need to plan where you're going to gather your sample from the source. So are you trying to isolate your source as in say like a residence hall at a university, or are you trying to determine uh, an area of a town or are you just the whole entire town? So in that place, what you would do is you would make sure you would place your sample in your waste uh, water system where you can best get that information. So right at the residence hall outflow into the manhole, that would be your best shot to figure out residence halls if you're trying to isolate specific cases in that area, or again, in a certain area of town, uh, maybe just before it gets to a trunk line, or in your wastewater treatment plant, gather at that to determine the whole entire city. So, so planning where you're going to gather your source so you isolate a specific source, that is the first option that you, or first question you would really want to solve for yourself. Time pace versus flow pace sampling will help you determine uh, the concentration. Uh, if you do time pace, again, you're taking a sample every hour, every 15 minutes, whatever it may be, but it may not be representative in each one of those sample bottles what um, over the whole entire, unless you do it in individually time paced, a bottle for one o'clock, a bottle for two o'clock, that will allow you to tell you at that time what the what the concentration of COVID sampling um, would be. So that makes it a little more difficult. You got to plan ahead for for which way you would like to do this time pace or flow pace. Flow pace is more of what I usually see where every thousand gallons or every hundred gallons it takes a sample. So that way it's more flow pace and more representative of the volume of flow that goes through versus just a time of the day. So that's one of the next options that you need to consider when you're, when you're looking at sampling this. How quickly you need to recover your sample and for testing. So this kind of relies on wherever you're being, you're, you're getting your samples tested, which lab, they may require you to deliver in a certain amount of time frame from when the samples happen. Um, so being able to quickly get to your sampler 
uh, versus shutting down a street or whatever you need to do to get to your samples, that would be one of your decisions on where you place it as well and how quickly you need to get that information. How can we preserve our samples? Um, the, sampler, the samples that are taken, usually you're trying to determine a certain concentration of some sort of either chemical or metal or uh, biological sample. Um, there are different types of protocols depending on what you are trying to sample. So how do we preserve our samples? The first, first way is actually using a sample preservative. So putting something in your bottles that whenever a sample is taken, that that preserves the, at that time the sample is taken, what, the, what you're trying to sample for. So say you're trying to sample for something biological. You would put something in that to preserve that biological sample so it doesn't change over time for when you go out to gather the samples and deliver them to the lab. So that would be based purely on what you're um, actually sampling for. So check your guidelines for whatever you're trying to sample for and whatever your lab is requiring you to sample to preserve that for them to get that most representative sample at that time. The next way we do that is cooling. Now this would be more of like a biological one where you want to cool the sample uh, via a passive method like say ice or some sort of cool packs that are inside of the sampler itself to uh, make sure that that sample gets cooled down as quickly as it can so there is not a growth of say like an algae or bacteria or something like that in a warm sample environment uh, which then is no longer representative to the sample environment that you took it from. So using that cooling, using ice um, in our samplers, the portable samplers, you can pack ice in there. Uh, they're actually insulated as well to help that ice last as long as you can. So just putting those samples in there and then that would hopefully give you the best representative sample for your lab to get at that time. Another way you can do it is using our refrigerated samplers. So they're portable refrigerated samplers. We make a, one's called the Glacier or the Avalanche uh, that then could use active cooling, meaning it's using batteries to power the refrigerator to keep that cold at all times until you go out to gather the sample. So again, we have passive and active. One's more is an actual refrigerator. The other would use a, just uh, the passive one through ice. Okay, just an overview of the choosing your sampler selection for your site and your application. So one of the, I just these are some of the questions I come up with when people are looking to start a sampling routine or maybe just get some feedback or some ideas on what they need to do for sampling is do you need to take composite or sequential sampling? That'll help drive you to which sampler you need to use. Uh, composite being a single bottle, so all your samples go into that one bottle, and then you take a representative sample for your lab or whatever you may need to do. The other one is sequential sampling, which means each sample or multiple samples go into individualized bottles for a certain time frame or flow. Now this is used for, I need to determine a specific concentration at a specific time versus a composite, which just gives you an overall view. So determining which way you want to go with your sample routine, that's the first choice. Do I need to have a refrigerated sampler or can I just get along with a passive cooled sampler using ice? Uh, or do I need an actual refrigerator to cool down my sampler? The next one is our complexity of the sample program required. So on our complexity of the sample program, do you need to have a sampler that can do a lot of complex sampling, multi-parameters, multiple uh, uh, pacing, so either or multiple parts. Maybe I need to take one part at this time and one part at another time to take part of the bottle. What is my pacing time versus, do I need to do time or flow pace? So if I need to do time paced, um, I don't need to connect up to another flow meter to measure flow to then pace the sampler. Or do I need to have something measure my flow so I can pace the sampler based off of every X amount of gallons of flow. So the next part is, do I need any remote alarming via text? Say maybe I need a cell phone to send me a text message whenever I take a sample program started. 
or do I need to know when a certain parameter or depth or is, is reached? Do I need to get it alarming from that? So adding a cell phone option to your sampler would be a good one in that case. The last one is monitoring for conditions. Do I need a sampler that can monitor pH and then flow or rainfall to help trigger my samplers uh, to run the program when I have, like say for a stormwater situation, I wanna take start the sampler after the rain reaches a certain amount. And I also want to wait until the water rises and I take that sample at that time. So those are some of the con conditions and options I would look for when choosing a portable sampler and help you figure out those for uh, your sample program. Uh, I, I appreciate your time today. I am going to open this up for any questions. So please uh, be putting those questions in the uh, Q&A feature and we will answer those shortly. Well, thank you, Greg. And it looks like we have received several questions. So I will let, turn it over to you to answer. Thank you, Sharon. Um, yeah, it looks like we have a question here. Is First one I can see is that, uh, is it necessary to replace the internal batteries of the samplers every five years? Um, typically that is not required uh, as, as the, the sampler is used, there's an internal lithium battery which help maintain your clock time and your program. Um, one thing I look for for if a, if a battery needs to be replaced is if say you pull a battery, uh, the main battery off for power and you plug it back in if your sample program goes away and you have to reprogram again. Well, that's definitely a sign that that internal battery which was supposed to keep your program in place uh, has failed and you need to replace that, sending it in for service. Uh, they can help you out with that. Uh, I typically see five, seven, or it's probably more like seven to 10 years, uh, maybe even longer, depending on the usage. Uh, so that's something to just look at. Uh, next question was, what is the device called that allows you to suspend the sampler? Um, we make what's called a pro hanger. It looks like a X that goes across the manhole and hangs from just inside the rim of the, where the lid goes. Uh, it holds uh, it, let, it goes onto each one of those little ledges, and then in the middle of it is where the suspension of the sampler head or sampler center section base, all the whole sampler itself gets suspended down in the manhole. Um, then you would pull that whole thing up to the surface to gather your sample, but it would keep it under the street uh, instead of having to have a, a, a enclosure off to the side. Um, somebody asked uh, for a specific model that was shown at a specific time. I missed that, so I apologize. I know most of the pictures that we had in there were of 6712 samplers, um, the avalanche sampler, the glacier sampler, those are refrigerated ones. I know there was some GLS samplers and some 3700, 3710 samplers. So uh, since this is more, more on the lines of uh, the portable sampling, I'm pretty sure I nailed one of those was the right one. Uh, so I apologize if I didn't catch exactly which one you were looking at. Um, I did see that uh, someone also asked a question about the the the, uh, the sampler power source, like using a cable that has alligator clips. That's our standard, is the alligator clips. Um, I, I know at some point in time, we may have some that have like ring terminals available uh, from a special product item. But most of the time, if the alligator clips don't work, I've had customers that will put their own ends on the, the alligator clips or ring terminals or whatever they want to use uh, just at that place. So that it has the right connector to go into our sampler to power it, but then they can provide their own power connections. Um, next one I have here is use multiple inputs and log which input triggered. Um, so looking at inputs into say like a 6712, we have the ability to do enabling based off of um, uh, level, flow, um, rain gauge, uh, pHs, those kind of things. Um, so it would tell you which input triggered it. Also looking at the data should be able to tell you that. Uh, you can put OR conditions in the enabling sections of the 6712. So you could say rain of a certain amount or level of a certain amount or pH. So you could kind of make a, a long equation that has ORs and ANDs in it to to specify yours down to for your application and your conditions. Um, another one here is what are the alternatives to AC power for samplers placed in remote locations? Um, all the samplers, the even the refrigerated samplers, the avalanche and the glacier, 
um, have the ability to connect up to a, in remote locations, you would want to use like a battery source, like a deep cycle marine battery is a great source for those kind of things. Um, if you have more of a permanent site, I guess, or, or you want to put up something, you could put up solar panels to recharge your batteries at that location. And then, so in remote locations where you're maybe sampling, uh, a solar panel would come in great uh, to keep that battery charged and uh, maintain your sampling program without you having to visit each site to drop in a new battery. Um, let's see here. Uh, see. Uh, would like to recommend installing the avalanche sampler as a site to susceptible to flooding. Okay, so if it's susceptible to flooding, I would recommend not putting it in the floodplain unless you're able to get out there before that, um, before that would happen. Uh, raising it above that source would be my best option. Or, like I said, these samplers can, I, I've seen people put, you can put up to 99 feet in length of suction line. But we just want to make sure that whatever distance you're going vertically is less than 28 feet for the avalanche. So that's our vertical rise of our that we can pull the sample up. Um, so that would be our best idea to get that up there. Um, how long does it take on average to charge a NICAD battery? We recommend 15 hours of charging it before you go out to deploy it. So pretty much overnight. So if you put them on and charge them and then overnight before you go out to change them out on site. Uh, that would be a great way to, to make sure you're fully charged. It's usually about 15 hours of full charge. Um, flow actuator, can a flow actuator work on a 3700? Uh, a 3700 sampler has the exact same capabilities of all the other samplers we have, the uh, GLS, the Glacier, all those, where you can bring in a, uh, like a liquid level actuator is one of the ones I would see in this this respect is something that would, uh, when the water touches it, it enables the sampler. Or if you're kind of, I don't know what you're exactly going for, but if you were looking for enabling it based off a certain amount of flow from say like a PLC or SCADA system, there is an inhibit signal that's in all of those samplers, all, the, all of our portals, portable samplers. If you inhibit the sampler uh, using, uh, it's pin F, which is our uh, inhibit sampler line. If you pull that to ground, that will inhibit the sampler until you enable it. So if you have some sort of control source that you can use to do that, that would work as well. Um, look in here. What to do if a liquid detector is malfunctioning? Um, if there's a full volume of liquid, but no more liquid. Okay, so the norm, no more liquid means we saw liquid initially. It's different than the no liquid detector, but no more liquid, let me expand on that. Just it means we saw water at the liquid detector, but we stopped seeing it. So that expansion and contraction of the, uh, the pump tube was not there continuously through the sample. So we, we ran out of liquid. Uh, I mean, maybe your source doesn't have enough liquid to pull. Uh, that's what I would look for is just uh, looking for like the air pockets in the line uh, from the source or something. Uh, it's kind of tough to draw from that conclusion. I mean, calling into our product support group would be a great one to, to step through with somebody um, that in more personal uh, in more more in person uh, response for you there. Um, got something with a life expectancy. Uh, the of the refrigeration units on a portable sampler um, depends on the uh, hate to say it this way, but it depends on the applications they're in and what kind of conditions they're in. So, I mean, if they're out in a lot of H2S gas, we have the more the possibility of corrosion over time. Everything is powder coated on the refrigeration system. Um, so it's to try to prevent as much uh, corrosion or anything happening with the samplers that we can. Uh, but just based off of where you're sampling from and what kind of materials you're sampling, there's just a, a, a very wide range of the, the life expectancy. Uh, question for uh, then how to navigate the programming. So I don't know which sampler you're, you're talking about here, but we do have a lot of videos up on our, uh, on our website. So I'm gonna plug that I guess right now is our isco.com website, the teledyneisco.com website. There is in the, the main page, you'll see a, a bar that says service right in the blue bar. If you click on that, that'll actually take you to 
um, an environmental, uh, you can go to the water, wastewater section, and we have a lot of YouTube videos and they are continually adding more videos. Um, right now I know up there is how to reset some of our samplers and also how to uh, change your pump tube. So there's a great how-to videos that are located up on YouTube, but you can link, th link to them through our website and reach them there. Um, will the ISCO be able to send receive SDI 12 messages? Um, SDI 12 in our capabilities with our 6712 sampler, we can bring in parameters or information. Uh, the information that we're looking for there is um, say level out of, out of like a sonde or some sort of other device that's able to give us um, the the information we're looking for that you're, you're wanting to use to enable or disable or trigger sampling based off of say a pH or turbidity or something like that. The SDI 12 capability of the 6712 allows you to bring that information in and use it for triggering and enabling. Mentioned uh, low level strainers, are these available in PVC? Um, we do make um, our standard strainer in PVC, I believe but not the low flow strainers. So um, sorry about that, but uh, I know uh, they're always looking to expand and maybe uh, like our product, uh, product group will hear some of these suggestions and we'll pass that along as well. That's one thing in product support group, we always pass along um, uh, any suggestions that customers have for, hey, this product would be a good idea for you guys to do. We, we like to pass that along to our, our, our uh, product groups um, to, to help them come up with new products for you. Let me see here. How long can the battery stay on the charger? Um, most of the chargers will have some sort of uh, the ability to, the, they'll trickle charge. Uh, I, I don't like to keep batteries on for an like extended length of time. I don't really have a time frame for you on that. Uh, I would just say if you would charge them, charge them 15 hours before you get ready to deploy them, that's your, your best option on that. Uh, just to make sure you don't um, just have the sitting on the charger there. Uh, they just will slowly discharge over time. They just have a na uh, standard slow discharge. Um, so then we can, uh, I would just recommend uh, putting them on a charger just before you go to deploy them like a day before. Uh, looking on the multiple inputs, um, level pH sensors, um, composite sampler or discrete sampler with multiple inputs. Uh, so this was kind of a, in relation to that other question. Um, let me look here real quick. So, so with multiple inputs for, I'm looking, I'm guessing you're meeting for discrete sampling for multiple bottles, uh, each sample bottle meaning a different parameter. Uh, no, uh, you could do in a 6712 a two-part program so you can assign half of the bottles or part of the bottles or a couple bottles to one side of the program. Uh, say you're gonna do a, a stormwater sampling where you wanna do the first set of the bottles on a, uh, you wanna gather a lot of samples right at the beginning on the surge of the water that comes down on the first flush. The additional bottles, so say maybe bottles eight through 24, you wanna do on a time-based sample that is uh, every two hours or an hour or something. So you miss, so you get all that first flush in the first couple bottles, and then you do a time sampling program maybe after that. So that's where I usually see multiple samplers, but I don't think we can do what you're, with the level pH sampler, sensors to trigger each individual bottle for that. So that's a little more uh, spe specific for a type of sampling program. How often should the ISCO samplers be calibrated? Um, this to me is if you notice your sample volumes are, are off or a little bit higher, a little bit lower, I would recommend calibration. We don't typically recommend a specific calibration schedule because when I talk to different municipalities or locations all around the country, Everybody has their own set of rules, I guess. Um, their, their municipality or their uh, Department of Environmental Quality maybe requires them to calibrate samples or calibrate pH sensors at different intervals. So one of the things I know we don't um, specify specifically uh, for customers is how often they need to do things. So that way they are not 
running outside of the rules of their general location. Uh, I have another sample here, that's, or another question, about auto samplers being placed in locations where there are hazardous gases. None of our portable samplers um, have the um, have a hazardous location rating or a class one div one location rating. Um, so what we recommend is if there is a hazardous location you're needing to place a portable sampler in, we don't place it in that location. We place it in a safe location and we run the suction line strainer down into the location where you can gather that sample safely. Uh, the, don't want to trigger any issues with that kind of stuff. So that's that's the quickest way to get around um, with the problems of, uh, of a hazardous location. Um, got one here that's about the price range. I, I know that uh, uh, I believe uh, Bob Glenn wanted to chime in on that, if that's proper. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, actually, uh, we just wanted to offer <clears throat> some feedback on a couple of these questions here as we finish things up. Um, uh, price range is, is really uh, a question that has a lot of variables associated with it. Uh, just from a budgetary standpoint, you can basically say anywhere from two to $4,000 for portable samplers, uh, depending on the types of uh, accessories uh, that a person would use. So um, if you get into the refrigerators, they're a little bit more than that, but contact your local ISCO rep or the factory for specific information related to pricing. We can discuss your application and make sure that the accessories and supporting components uh, are all quoted and you get everything that you need. And then uh, the one other thing I wanted to chime in on, and Greg, you did a good job of answering the question earlier, uh, related to installing an avalanche or any kind of a sampler um, in a site that may be susceptible to flooding. And um, Greg hit the nail on the head when he said, uh, really what we have to look at is um, the overall vertical lift. Um, now we do, as Greg mentioned earlier in the presentation, have the ability to uh, control remote sample pumps and peristaltic pump will push sample further than it will pull it. So you always have the option in that situation if you have an extreme amount of lift uh, to go with the uh, a, a portable sampling pump down closer to the source um, and you know uh, protect that against flooding and then uh, send that, uh, push that sample back up to the avalanche at a higher elevation. The other thing is um, this is really the type of complex application which warrants a phone call uh, to your local rep or to uh, our application support team or even myself. Um, and that is because uh, we, we've got so many years of cumulative experience doing these kinds of things and have seen so many different applications. I've seen all kinds of crazy and innovative ways um, to get a sample um, for equipment um, uh, in, a, in a flood zone area, um, which has allowed customers to um, uh, to be able to collect samples even under the most extreme conditions. Um, so when you get those kinds of applications, please do reach out to our team, uh, either the rep or the factory, so that we can work with you more closely, maybe get some site-specific photos um, and, and take a look at the particulars to try to help you with your problem. Um, we always like to say at ISCO, we're a lot more uh, than just an equipment provider. We are a partner uh, in, in, your, in your solution. So Anyway, uh, that's all I wanted to add. And Greg, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to chime in. No problem. It looks like I, I don't have any other questions at the moment, but if you do come up with some questions, um, you're welcome to call into our product support group. Um, we're there from 7 Central to 5 p.m. Central time. Uh, we have multiple guys in there that have been there uh, 20 plus years, all of us. So all of us have a wealth of knowledge and, and information we can we can give to you to help you get through any of your problems or help you troubleshoot issues. Programming, uh, that's what we're there for, and we're we're happy to help.